years ago, Anthony Newley sang, What Kind of a Fool Am I? to the top of the charts. And uh, I looked up in the dictionary to see what a fool is, or one of my associates did for me. And the Bible has a lot to say about fools and what a fool is. Proverbs 10, 21, it says, Fools die for the want of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7 says, Fools despise wisdom. Uh, when P.T. Barnum came to this country many years ago, he said, The American people want to be fooled, and I'm here to fool them. He said, A fool is born every minute. And uh, now synonyms that you can find for the word fool is stupid person, bonehead, blockhead, simpleton, chump, nitwit, goose, sap, numbskull, ignoramus, beetlehead, whatever you want. A uh, one who has been imposed on by others, a stooge, a gullible, or a dupe. Now, in the Bible, it may mean all of this, but it also has a moral meaning in the Bible and is a very important word in the Bible. And the verses seem almost paradoxical. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, Let him become a fool. And Proverbs 1.7 says, Fools despise wisdom. And God is speaking from the divine standpoint. In one passage, the fool is an unthinking, thoughtless, careless person without true understanding. In the other passage, the word fool is used from the standpoint of people who have received Christ because the world laughs at them and says they're foolish and ridiculous. They're fools. So there are unwise fools and they're wise fools. Now, Jesus said, whoever calls his brother a fool is in danger of hellfire. You be very careful how you call another person a fool. I wouldn't dare use that name for you or for anybody else. Never use the word fool in anger, the Bible says. But I'm telling you what God says about it in certain instances. First, there's the atheistic fool. It's repeated twice in Psalm 53, 1 and Psalm 14, 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. But in Hebrew, it actually means there is no God for me. In other words, the, this fool deliberately says there is no God for me. He's not saying there's no God. He's saying there's no God for me. Then there's the practical atheist. You see, there are many people that are really not atheists, but they are practical atheists in the sense that they live like an atheist. You profess to believe in God, but you don't live like you believe in God. You live as though there is no God. You too, in a sense, are an atheist. And there are hundreds here tonight like that. You believe in God with your mind. You may go to church, but you live as though God does not exist as far as you are concerned. And so you are an atheist in a sense. And then secondly, the Bible talks about the mocking fool, the mocking fool. Fools make a mock of sin, Proverbs 14, 9. Here is God in all of his holiness. And the Bible tells us that we've sinned against him. We've broken his laws and we're under the sentence of death. We're under the sentence of death. I saw a film tonight on television on one of the news programs telling how many men and women are on death row in the United States right now. Under the sentence of death. All of us here tonight are under the sentence of death. The wages of sin is death, and we have all sinned and broken the laws of God. And so we're all sentenced to die. We are to die physically. The graveyards are full of, full of people that are there because sin caused death. And then sin also causes spiritual death. Your soul is dead. Your spirit is dead. Physically, you're alive, but your soul that lives inside your body is dead toward God. So you're a walking dead person under the sentence of death. And the only way that you can have that sentence lifted is to come to Christ by repentance of sin and faith in Him as your Lord and your Savior. If you would like that sentence lifted, if you would like your sins wiped out as though they had never existed, if you would like to be justified in the sight of God, pick up that telephone right now you that are watching by television. Pick it up and call the number that you see on your screen and a counselor will answer. And the counselor will talk to you about how you can come to know Christ. As many people here tonight, I hope and believe and pray, will find Christ as their Lord and Savior. But there are many people that make a mockery of sins. They mock God's standards. 
God's standards of sex, God's standards of marriage, God's standards concerning divorce and ethics and morality and social justice. We make a mockery of it. We laugh at it. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Don't ever doubt it. Your sin, your sin will find you out, though no one on earth may discover it. You may never be caught. You may never have to pay for it here, as far as you can tell. But your sin will someday be found out. No one ever commits one sin that isn't found out. Everything that you did in the darkness, every evil thought that you ever had is going to be found out because it'll all be recorded. It's being recorded awaiting the judgment day. It's being recorded on tape machines, far more sophisticated than anything we have. It's being recorded. Even your thoughts and your sins will find you out and it'll be exposed to the whole universe. Will find you out. Will. It's only a question of time. The word will is definite. Will find you out. Find. Perhaps you've deceived everyone else, your wife, your family, your church, your friends, but the Bible says your sin will definitely find you out. A detective at last, after running away so long and hiding so long, God's hand will come on your shoulder and say, I have found you. You've been found out. We now know. And then thirdly, there's the slandering fool, the slandering fool. He that hideth hatred with lying lips and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. Passing along an evil story about others, maligning other people's character, wrecking their reputations by evil gossip. Gossiping is listed in the Bible as one of the worst of all sins. And yet how frequent that's done even in circles that call themselves Christians. It's a terrible sin in the sight of God and God says that person is a fool. You wouldn't think of killing a person with a gun or a knife. But then many times we assassinate a character or try to pull someone down or to get even or because of jealousy by whispering innuendos. Someone told me or he did thus and so. We commit murder by character assassination, worse than killing a man with a pistol, a knife, or a club. He that others a slander, the Scripture says, is a fool. And then fourthly, there's the Christian fool. The Christian fool. Remember the road to Emmaus after Jesus Christ had died on the cross for our sins and he'd been raised again? And remember he was appearing to the disciples in fact, 11 different appearances after his resurrection. And this is one of them. And these two disciples were on the way to Emmaus outside of Jerusalem. They were sad. They were disappointed. They were disillusioned. And they were mumbling and groaning among themselves. And another man joined them. And they didn't recognize who he was. And he talked to them. said, why are you so downcast? They said, oh... We thought he was to be the Messiah. Haven't you heard all the happenings in Jerusalem during the past week about this Jesus who did wonderful things? We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he'd come to save the world, but he didn't. He disappointed us. They killed him on a cross, and now the third day has passed, and we heard rumors that he might be raised from the dead, but we don't accept that. And then Jesus said, Oh, fool. You're fools. Then he started expounding to them the scriptures from Moses through the prophets as to who he really was. And then he went to spend the evening with them and he was sitting at the meal in their home in Emmaus. And all of a sudden their eyes were open and they saw it was Jesus. In other words, the Christian fool who has the word of God in his hand, who reads his testimony, and yet doubts the promises of God. Jesus said, oh, you fools, for not believing the scriptures that he was going to rise from the dead and someday he's coming back. And then, fifthly, there's the covetous fool. And the story is told in Luke, the 12th chapter. Jesus told the story 
about a rich man in his barns. You remember he built his barns and he said he was going to retire because he'd made enough money now, probably going to go to Southern California, Florida, come here to Idaho to this beautiful place and retire. He'd made enough money. And he said, soul, take thine ease, drink and be merry. And that night he had a heart attack and when he was dying, there was a voice heard from heaven that said, Thou fool, this night thy soul is required of thee. And the scripture says, Jesus said, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, he tried to find happiness in the wrong place, money. He ignored the power of influence in that no man liveth unto himself. He must have had a family. He disregarded death. He had made no provision for eternity. He had provision for his retirement. How many men and women I know who have planned for retirement, planned everything, but they haven't prepared to die and they die shortly after they retire? It's amazing. I've thought about that. Some people announce their retirement. You read two or three weeks later that they drop dead of a heart attack. They thought they were going to have five or 10 or 15 or 20 years that they could just take it easy and enjoy life. But it doesn't always work out that way. You better be sure that you have prepared to meet God. Every person who is more concerned about getting some of this world's goods and leaving out the preparation for eternity is a fool. Or the person who spends their time in social climbing or having pleasure more than eternal things is a fool in the sight of God. If you're not concerned about your home in heaven, you're not concerned about the riches that will never fail, not concerned about laying up treasure where moth and rust doth not corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal, then you're a fool. If you'd ask this man, what is your name? Well, he'd say, my name's the rich man. Or I'm the prosperous man that you read about. Or I'm an eminent man. Or I'm a great man in the neighborhood. Or I'm a famous man. My name is in the paper all the time. Then ask God, Lord, what is this man's name? And the answer comes back, fool. He's a fool. That's his name. The rich man knew every name but the right one. He had been called by his family name, his given name, his ranks, his titles, his wealth, the flatteries of men. But in the sight of God, his name was Thou Fool. That's all we know about him, that he was just a rich fool that laid up treasures on earth but laid up nothing for heaven. And how many of us are in the same category? You may not be rich in the sense that this man was rich, but everybody in America is rich compared to Bangladesh and people that I've, where we've been in many places of the world, like in Africa or as Victor was talking about in, in Vietnam, where he was a missionary for some years. Very few of you would stir if I would look out on this audience and say, fool, come here, I'd like to see you. How many of you would get up and come? <laughs> Very few, maybe nobody. But the Bible says, how are they brought into desolation as in a moment? Quickly, it can all end. Your dream house comes tumbling down. Trouble in the family. The wealth is gone. Here was a man, a multimillionaire perhaps, but standing a hand's breadth away from his own grave, counting on everything in this life, the happiness, the joy that this life could give him, and he's called in the Bible by Jesus a fool. And then seventhly, there's another kind of a fool, or sixthly, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. 1 Corinthians 1.18, But unto us which were saved it is the power of God. What the world counts foolish, we have rested our eternal salvation on. And when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, turn your back on the pleasures and the sensual lust and things of this world, people think you're a fool. The world that does not know Christ looks foolish to me. 
Why can't they see? Why can't they understand? I want to grab everybody I see on the street and everybody we pass, everybody in the hotel. I want to grab them and say, look here, Christ could change your life. I see their empty faces and I, I see the ho hear the hollow laughter. And I see them drinking, trying to drink their, themselves into some happiness or taking the drugs and that hollow stare that they have. And I say, oh, if I could only just shake them loose. But you see, only the Holy Spirit can do that. I cannot do the work of the Holy Spirit for him. The Holy Spirit must convict them of sin. He must also lift this veil that's over their minds. And so salvation is of the Lord, the Bible says. If anyone desires wisdom, let him take his place in identification with Jesus Christ. What the world calls foolish, I'm resting my salvation on the cross of Christ, no matter what the world may think of him or of me. We are fools for Christ's sake, willing for the world to look at us as out of our minds, willing to be accounted as the very offscoring of the earth because we've turned to Christ. Are you one of the devil's fools? Are you willing to be a fool for Christ's sake? The Bible says in Proverbs 12, the way of a fool is right in his own eye. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Which road are you on? The narrow road that leads to eternal life or the broad road that leads to destruction? You have to make a choice. The Scripture says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Are you going to continue to be a fool in the sight of God? Or are you going to become another kind of fool the Christ fool that the world will call a fool and call foolishness. Because you see, when you come to Christ, there's a price to pay. And one of the prices you pay is being misunderstood by some members of your family, some people in the community, some people where you work or where you go to school. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, come and take up the cross and follow me. You see, the cross that you bear, the cross that you bear is identification with Christ. It's not some special sickness that you get or some trouble you get. It's identifying with Christ and letting people laugh at you and being willing for them to make sport of you if necessary for following Christ. That's your cross. And if you're not willing to take that cross, you cannot be his follower, he said. Are you willing to take that cross? Are you willing to turn your life totally over to Christ? Some of us have got one foot in heaven and one foot in hell, as it were. One foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom of God. And we're straddling the fence. God does not allow fence straddlers. You cannot be a mugwomp. That's what a mugwomp is, a fence straddler. God, Christ does not allow that. He allows no neutrality. You can't not be both. You must come all out. For him, And you'll find that all the way through the Bible. You'll find it all the way through the teachings of Jesus. A great crowd was following Jesus one day. And he turned and talked to them about the fact that he was going to die on the cross. And it said, many followed him no more. Why? Because they couldn't take this talk of the cross. Do you want Christ in your heart? Pick up that telephone right now if you're watching by television. Talk to that counselor. Make that call. And if, you, if it's a busy signal, call again. They'll be there all evening, all over the country. And you can talk to somebody and receive Christ into your heart tonight. Because you see, when Christ died on the cross, it says that the crowd down below, the mob below, ridiculed and laughed. And they said, what a fool. You saved others, but you cannot save yourself. <laughs> and Jesus was hanging there. And in heaven, 72,000 angels, 10 legions drew their swords, ready to come and rescue him. But he said, no, I love them. And when he died on the cross, he took your sins. Every sin that you've ever committed, he took on that cross. He took your death penalty for you. And because he was the son of God, and because he was sinless, he could bear your sins. And God has accepted his death as a sin offering 
for our sins. So that when God looks at me now, he doesn't see Billy Graham the sinner. I am a sinner. I have sinned, but I've placed my sins under the blood of Christ. And the blood that was shed on the cross washes my sins away symbolically in the sight of God so that when God looks at me, he cannot see my sins. And God has a unique ability that you don't have. God can forget. And it says that he forgets your sins. In other words, the tapes are erased from the time you were born till the time you die. Because if one sin ever remained on those tapes, you'd never make it to heaven. God is righteous and holy. And before you can get into heaven, you must be righteous too. And the only way you can get any righteousness is to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he offers you that righteous clothing tonight, free. You don't have to pay for it. But you have to do three things. You must repent of your sins. That means you're willing to change your way of life. You're willing to change completely and put Christ first in your life from this moment on. You may be a member of the church. You may be a Catholic, a Mormon, Jewish, Protestant, whatever you are. You need Christ, and you want to make that commitment. I'm not asking you to join a church tonight, a specific church. I'm asking you to make sure that your sins are forgiven and that you're ready for heaven. First, repent. Second, receive him by faith into your heart. Faith means trust, total commitment. It means that he becomes the pilot of your plane or he becomes the driver of your car, of your life. You turn all the decision-making over to him. And that's a wonderful thing. You trust him for your salvation. And then the third thing, you're willing to obey him. Study the scriptures and pray and obey him and do what he says and be his follower no matter what the cost. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment tonight. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen hundreds of people at each service do so far. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming, I want to make that commitment. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to know the sentence of death has been lifted. I want to know I'm going to heaven. Why do I ask you to come forward publicly? Because Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus said, now is the, or the scripture says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise that there'll ever be a tomorrow for you. It's tonight. I believe there are hundreds of people here tonight that may never have this moment again in your whole life in which you're so close to the kingdom of God. Just get up and come. Fathers, mothers, young people, hundreds of you. You want Christ in your heart tonight. You want to make that commitment. You get up and come. Quickly. And as people are coming forward here at the Coliseum, you make that telephone call right now. The number is on your screen, and counselors are standing by ready to help you. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that are watching by television can see that here in Boise, Idaho, many people are coming to make this commitment to Christ tonight. You can make that commitment right now where you are. You may be in a bar room. You may be in a nightclub. You may be in a hotel room. You may be in your living room or in your bedroom. Just say yes to Christ and let him come into your heart. As you can see, men and women and boys and girls from all over the Colosseum have come forward tonight to commit their heart and life to Jesus Christ. This is also a time of decision for many of you. Until then, this is Cliff Barrow speaking for Billy Graham and every member of the team saying goodbye and may God richly bless you.
If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching. Now tonight I want you to turn with me to Deuteronomy the 32nd chapter and the 31st verse. Deuteronomy, that's in the Old Testament. Over toward the beginning of the Old Testament in what is called the Pentateuch. The first five books of the Bible. And there's a verse tucked away in Moses' farewell address to ancient Israel that says this in the 31st verse. It says this, For their rock is not our rock. For their rock is not our rock. In the latter part of the last century, a man toured America and Great Britain, and many times he used that text. I'd never noticed that text until I read one of his sermons a few weeks ago. D.L. Moody, their rock is not our rock. Moses is now an old man. He has led the children of Israel for 40 years in the desert. He's been a king, a father, a president, a leader all these years. And now only Joshua and Caleb are left. All the other generation are dead. And all the people standing out before him are young people. Young people just like you with the same desires, the same aspirations, the same longings, the same dreams, the same problems, the same sins, the same temptations that you have. And Moses, looking upon this vast audience, an entirely new generation, with his long white beard, preaching to them, warning them, warning them of other gods and false gods, that are going to come up to take the place of the true and the living God. And he said, if you follow these false gods, the judgment of God will come upon you. And he referred to God as a rock. And he referred to these other gods as rocks, spelled with a little R. The rock God was spelled with a capital R. Now, why did he use the term rocks as an illustration? The children of Israel had been wandering around among the rocks for 40 years. They knew what a rock was. They knew the hard rocks and the soft rocks and all kinds of rocks. And he said, their rock is not our rock. What are some of the rocks in America right now that young people, are in danger. You know, I talked to a man just a few weeks ago who claimed to be an atheist. I don't know whether he was really an atheist, but he said he was an atheist. He said, I've been an atheist all my life. He said, my father was an atheist. He said, I am now 71 years of age. And I said, what do you have to look forward to? He said, nothing. He said, life has been miserable for me. Well, I said, why don't you give up your atheism? Why don't you believe in God? He said, my pride won't let me. Their rock is not our rock. 
compare it with Paul. The Apostle Paul said, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me in that day. What a contrast between an atheist and a believer. One man was facing death fearful, empty. The other man was facing death full of confidence. Their rock is not our rock. Secondly, young people, many young people are going after materialism. They've fallen for the materialistic God that says things are more important than anything else. I find across the country today a deep economic discontent among people. I find it in Europe. I find it around the world. And people are wanting more and more things. And we forget that we have the highest standard of living the world has ever known. We still have poverty. The government is trying to do something about it. The church is trying to do something. Hundreds of social agencies are trying to do something about it. But the people that we call living in poverty would be considered rich if they lived in Bangladesh or in many other parts of the world. We're a rich nation. But still, with all of our riches, we're dissatisfied. We want more, 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 more. The more we get, the more we want. Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. He said a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. A famous man was quoted in the paper the other day as saying, I'm worth millions of dollars, but I can tell you this, that's not where it's at. I'm worth millions, but that's not where it's at. Adolf Burl, in his study of power, points out riches make people solitary, lonely, and often afraid. Many times a rich man has a loneliness and a fear. Because you see, if you make riches, you're God. If you make things, you're God. If you make money, you're God. It leaves you empty. George Bernard Shaw said, there are two tragedies in life. One is not to get your heart's desire, and the other is to get it. You think if you had a lot of money, you'd be happy. Some of you have already got a lot, and you're not happy. Two tragedies. You didn't get it, and you did get it. You see, without God, life loses its zest and its purpose and its meaning, even though you may have money. Young people in America today are revolting against affluency. And yet today, many young people are prisoners of a culture which puts a premium on things rather than moral values. Their rock is not our rock. Don't make money your God. There's nothing wrong with having money if you got it legitimately and honestly. It's what you do with it. It's your attitude toward it. Do you love it? Has it become your God? Does it dominate you? Does it have such a hold on you that you don't have time for God? Their rock is not our rock. That's not the rock we want. And then thirdly, their aims and objectives are not our rock. What are the objectives of the average person in America today? Power, pleasure, leisure, money. What is the objective of a Christian? To glorify God, to live for God, to do the will of God to love your neighbor, to help your neighbor, to make an impact in society for God and to leave the world a little better place because you were here. What is your objective? Is your objective to get all the leisure time you can, to have all the pleasure you can have, to make all the money you can make? What is your objective? What's your goal in life? Where are you headed? There are rocks is not our rock. And then fourthly, there's pleasure. 
You know, in America today, we're searching for new thrills. We've worn out the old amusement. You're not to become so absorbed. The Bible says be temperate in all things. There are legitimate pleasures that can take most of your time and occupy most of your thinking that are legitimate in themselves, but they soon become sin because they've taken the place of God. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore, said the psalmist. Do you have that kind of pleasure? The kind of pleasure that's not dependent on circumstances? the kind of pleasure that's not dependent on how you feel, the kind of pleasure that runs deep, that has been brought there by the Spirit of God. When the tide comes in, the rock of pleasure will turn into a sand. The sweetness of pleasure turns to bitterness and disappointment. Life becomes empty, sick, and a tragic thing. When pleasure is put first and becomes your God, they are rock. It's not our rock. There's the rock of revolution. All over the country we hear the word revolution. And many young people have fixed their hope and their dreams on change in the political system. And they believe that if they can get this revolution, it'll fix everything. I was with one of these young leaders whose name is known to many of you in New York some time ago. And I looked out across Manhattan. He said, we're going to burn it down. I said, what are you going to rebuild in its place? He said, we haven't gotten that far. I said, well, before you destroy the American ship, you better be sure that you can know how to build a raft. Many people have an idea that they, I think they, it's the excitement of revolution for revolution's sake. You know, every utopia has turned out to be a pipe dream in the history of the human race. Their rock is not our rock. Yes, we need change in America. But let's keep our freedom. Let's don't have revolution just for revolution's sake or we will destroy everything that's been built in the greatest nation in the history of the world. Seventhly, religiosity can become a God. You know, there's a great emphasis today on the occult. I was asked about it on television today in an interview. Satan worship. People today that are going after all kinds of false spirits across the country and in Europe and in the Far East as well. It's become a big thing and a big business. And many young people across the country are being fooled by all kinds of cults and spirits and devils and demons. Beware, you're dealing with the dark powers that are very real. How did Jesus overcome the devil? By arguing? No. By debating? No. He quoted scripture. The Bible says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was walking according to the will of God and he quoted the Bible. And every time he quoted the Bible, the devil was defeated. That's the reason it's important to memorize Scripture, study the Bible. And I'm so anxious that young people across America now that are finding Christ by the thousands will get into the Scriptures, get into the Word of God, learn it, desire the sincere milk of the Word that ye may grow thereby. Because if you don't, we're going to have a backlash in the next generation. And young people who have had an experience with Christ and don't become taught in the Scriptures are prime targets for the devil. Get into the Scriptures. Get to work for Christ. They are up is not our rock. Eighthly, their cure is not our cure. That's one of the problems of psychiatry. I'm for psychiatrists and psychologists. I send many people to them. But there's a point beyond which a psychiatrist who is not a 
a believer, there's a point beyond which he can't help. In many cases, he has no cure. And many of them have admitted this to me privately. And some of them are beginning to do it publicly and they're doing it in books now. You see, the cure of the world, the Freudian cure, is one direction, but the Christian cure is another. The Christian cure is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cure for a domestic problem? There's a father having problems with a son. What is the cure? The son in rebellion? The son going out on his own, seeking his own identity, doing things that appalls the father? The father becomes angry? The parents become upset? There is a Christian cure. The cure is Christ to go to our knees. And you know, I love the young people of this generation. I can see why a lot of them have rebelled. They have rebelled against the hypocrisies they've seen in us. They've seen us tell lies. They've heard us tell them not to smoke their pot and seen us drink our alcohol. They've heard us use those swear words. They've seen father and mother flirting with the next door neighbor. They've seen the sharp business deals that they knew were not right. They've seen the emphasis has been on things even while you went to church on Sunday, yet the whole emphasis of your life is materialistic. They've seen the hypocrisy, and they said, we don't want it. But let me tell you this, you young people, if you'd lived a few years ago, your life expectancy wouldn't have been very long because, you see, this generation was able to make some breakthroughs in medicine and in science that has given you all these marvelous drugs so you don't have to worry today about smallpox and polio and all of these other things that preoccupied people a generation or two ago and sent terror and fear through this community of Charlotte many times, through disease. There are many wonderful things that this generation has brought. Television, radio, brought the world into our living room. And this generation of people, my generation, worked hard. We came through the Depression. We didn't want you to ever have to go through a depression again. We came through World War II and we determined that we were going to do all we could to keep out of another great world war. And you young people must understand that this generation has done some good things even though we've done some bad things. And we want to help you as we hand the torch to you we want to help you change it and make it better. But we've got to, in all fairness, say that the problem lies deeper than we thought. The problem lies in the human heart. We found that we cannot legislate morals. We found we cannot pass a law and settle a race problem. We can help, but that doesn't solve it all. It's got to come from the human heart. And that's why Jesus said you must be born again. Their rock is not our rock. Their cure is not our cure. Our cure says you must be born again. Now what is this rock that is ours with the big capital R? The rock is God and the Bible tells us that the rock in the Old Testament was actually Jesus Christ. He was the rock, King of kings and Lord of lords, born of the Virgin Mary, died on the cross for our sins, rose again for our justification. He is the rock that we're to put our confidence and our faith in, and he's called in the Bible the rock of defense. When we put our trust in him, he takes our side, he takes our part, 
He helps us carry the load. And when you come to Jesus Christ as Savior, you don't have to, you don't have to live a life by yourself. You can't live the Christian life alone. Christ will be there. He is the rock that will help you to live the life. If God is for us, who can be against us? I'm glad that my defense at the great judgment of God is going to be in the hands of the greatest lawyer in the universe, Jesus Christ, our advocate. And the devil is going to say, look at Billy Graham. Ha <laughs> ha. Look at the sins he committed. Look at the things he did that are wrong. Jesus Christ is going to step, step up and be my representative. And he's never lost a case. And then he is a high rock, the Bible says, a watchtower. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Did you know that the Christian has a vantage point that the world doesn't have? Everybody's wringing their hands and saying, what's happening in the world? What's wrong with the world? Why is the world in such a mess? I can tell you. The simplest Christian in this audience tonight with no education at all can tell you exactly what's wrong with the world. Because the Christian has an insight that nobody else has. The Christian can tell you what's wrong with the world and the Christian can tell you what could put the world right. Because you see, we have a rock, a vantage point. Then the Bible teaches that our rock is a refuge. The Bible speaks of the cleft in the rock a hiding place from the storms of life, a place where we can go and pray and meditate and think and worship God. Rock is a foundation, for other foundation can no man lay than that was laid in Christ Jesus. Is Jesus Christ the foundation of your life? There were two men that Jesus told about. One built his house on the sand, one built it on the rock. The storm came. And the one that was built on the sand crumbled. And the one that was built on the rock lasted. Where are you building your life? Is it on the rock? Or is it on a false rock? A sandy rock that will crumble and erode? A shaly rock? Oh, there are some things that are eternal in our rock. The Bible says God is eternal. The eternal God is thy refuge. The Bible says that spiritual truth is eternal. The Bible says that God gives us eternal life. The Bible tells us that heaven is eternal. The Bible says God's judgment is eternal. He is an eternal rock. The Bible says prepare to meet thy God. The Bible says if in this life only we have hope, we're of all men most miserable. Even his enemies recognize that their rock is not our rock. Paul says of the rock in the wilderness in 1 Corinthians 10, that rock was Christ. Other rocks crumble and slide and erode and fall, but not Christ. Is he your rock? Is he your Lord and your master and your savior? Have you surrendered everything to him without reservation? You can tonight. You say, what do I have to do? You have to be willing to turn from your sins. You have to be willing to receive him as your Lord and your master and your savior. And you have to be willing to do it publicly. Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me openly and publicly, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. There's no such thing as secret discipleship. You come publicly. That's why I ask people to come forward, to receive Christ openly. That's part of it. It's an open acknowledgement that he is your rock. But I want to tell you what I said across Japan and India and across Africa. When you come to Jesus Christ and make him your rock with a capital R, you must turn from the other rock. And it will cost you something because some of the rocks in your life are wrong. Will you make Jesus Christ your rock of Gibraltar and stake your eternal destiny on him? I'm asking you to do that tonight and I'm asking hundreds of young people to make him their rock tonight 
and go out of here saying from this hour on, I'm going to follow him and serve him and I'm going to help change the world for Christ. That's the revolution we need.